There's a dog in the corner. Hello, Wendy. You can go to sleep. Just don't be noisy. She snores a lot. Got a bit of an issue with nostrils. Hello, welcome to the, welcome to Collector Creations. Uh, this is Anatomy of a Blu-ray for Summertime Machine Blues. This is a Chameleon Films release. Do you want to leave? Hmm? I was going to see if I could do a time travel joke, but I'm not going to. Uh, hello. <laughs> Welcome to Collector Creations. Wait, I've already done this. Uh, anyway, we're talking about Summer Time Machine Blues. This is a Chameleon Films release, which is really cool because that's an Australian label. So this is actually a limited edition set presented by Chameleon Films. If I open it up, there we go. So I guess we'll just kind of dive into it. Some detail, I guess. Chameleon Films. They are an Australian boutique label, I guess. I'm calling a boutique so currently because I don't see why not. It's it's our equivalent of you know Arrow Video and um, Eureka and stuff like that. Uh, I don't know a lot of details about the company itself. I've been following them for a few months now. This they had a three pack release come out at the end of August, which included these two releases for Exiled and Breaking Waves. So I will be watching them soon. I guess I just wanted to watch Summertime Machine Blues. I thought it was the shortest one. I uh, I was mistaken. It was actually the longest. Uh, oh, no, it's it's actually shorter by two minutes than, um, than Exiled, but uh, Breaking Waves was 90 minutes. I was expecting this to be 90 minutes for some reason. I don't know why. It didn't really bother me. But... Uh, yeah, so they're an Australian company. It's like Imprint, but they have this kind of cases, which I really like. This is the case. The back doesn't actually detail what the film is about, but it does detail the special features. Uh, so this is all the special features details. You've got details about the um, specs and stuff, and of course uh, classifications, all the people who made it and all that kind of stuff. And then you get an image, which does fold around to there, which if you open it up, and I take out the booklet, which I'll show off in a minute. Uh, you actually get the exact same artwork on the inside. It just comes with a barcode and the uh, PG rating. So you'll initially get it with that PG rating on the front, much like how that has the M rating on the front. And you can just turn it around, which I really like and wish a lot more people would do. I think it's a bit more expensive to do that, to print a double-sided sheet. But I really wish people would do that. I know... Umbrella does it occasionally, but a lot of the times they'll have, rely on a slipcover release and the, the inside cover will be alternate artwork and then alternate artwork on its inside sleeve as well, say like the Beyond Genres, for example. Another kind of boutique label. I don't know, it depends what you define as boutique, but realistically they all are. I, I always forget about Umbrella. I don't know, it's weird, but still. Yeah, so you got your discard as well, which I like connects the rainbow still. Uh, not much else to mention about the case. And everything um, I will note on the booklet. Actually, I might as well detail what the special features are because it does say limited collector's booklet featuring a new essay by film writer Haley Scanlon, uh, original audio commentary by director Katsuyuki Motohiro and writer Makoto Ueda with newly translated English subtitles. Uh, when I listened to it, I only watched the first 10 minutes of it, but basically it was the two of them talking about making the film and different elements about it and stuff. You can obviously hear the audio of the film, but you don't know what they're saying unless you speak Japanese. There's no subtitles for what the people in the film are saying. So basically, if you're watching the audio commentary, you're only going to be watching it for the audio commentary, which is fine. It also has a new interview of writer Makoto Ueda, which is about 22 minutes long, and a teaser and a theatrical trailer, which I didn't watch because... I don't really see the point of them. Um, I don't mind having them. It's like a cute little thing. Sure, why not? Uh, there is an art to trailers on the occasion. But yeah, so you got your booklet, which does fold out, which is nice. You get your credits for cast and crew and people who made the film, which is great. The e synopsis is actually on the first page, which is really unique, I think. Um, Chameleon Films have done that for all three of their releases so far, where they emphasize the special features on the pack and the artwork and stuff, and have the synopsis being in the first page of the booklet. The rest of the booklet is the essay. 
which I haven't actually read. I apologize. I, I, I don't really think I've had to deal with any of the uh, Nano Blu rays where I've actually had a booklet to read. But there is a several page booklet, which is really nice. Pretty easy to read. The colors are bright and pop. It's really as simple as that, and then you just get to the end of it. So, yeah, you get some Blu ray credits. There are some notations uh, outside of that. Yeah. It's pretty good. I, I, it's a cute little essay. So what can I say about the film? I guess some details. Do you want me to read the synopsis, I guess? Time. Albert Einstein and Stephen Hawking went on about it forever, but the big questions of time travel remain. Who stole Neem's, Neemie's shampoo, and how might spilling coke on the remote control spell the end of the universe? Uh, it's a remote control with an air con. And perhaps most importantly, how can nerdy guys get to meet girls? I would be honest, uh, that's not really answered in the movie. But hey, uh, maybe it is. Vaguely. Uh, it's an endlessly hot Japanese summer, and the members of the sci-fi club are hanging around, waiting out the school vacation. Slowly, small things start not making sense, until a time machine and a dork from the future arrive in their clubhouse. And all of a sudden, the time machine continuum is under threat. Of course, the nature of the threat is never exactly clear, but it will involve a lot of frantic comic complications to put things right. Uh, director Katsuyuki Motohiro, I don't exactly, I'm not great with pronouncing names, but Japanese names are really fun, is at the top of his game here, constructing a wildly playful and unfailingly inventive film that enjoys cult status among lovers of Japanese youth comedy. Yeah, it is a bit of a uh, cult classic, so I'll get into the video and audio. Actually, I'll just get a brief review of the film. I thought it was really fun. It took the first 15 minutes for like a good st setup for like the event of the film, and there are obvious, oh, eagle-eyed viewers will notice how there are discrepancies here and there in the background, which the commentary on the commentary they were saying, I was like, like, oh, audiences are probably thinking, what are the cast and crew doing? Why is this so, like... Why is this all messy? Why are the people doing shit in the background when they shouldn't be? Which, of course, it's a time travel movie. Even they were saying, oh, on second watch, you'd understand all this. I'm more of an eagle-eyed person when it comes to time travel films. Memento, for in particular, my dad was like, oh, that's a movie you have to watch twice because to get it all. I got it all on the first watch. Like, I don't want to be like, oh, I'm so smart. I can understand time travel movies. There are some really complicated time travel movies. I understand that. And there are movies that you got to be very focused on it to pick up all the details. And sometimes I just don't. But sometimes a time travel one like this, where I notice things in the background, they're not exactly very hidden. But I don't mind it. I, I think it's cute. It works with the film. And it's just nice. It's, it, it makes you more interested because the first 15 minutes is slow to get through, but then the rest of it really starts hitting. And overall, it's pretty good. It, it's a... Bloody slapper of a film, I'd say. So let's talk about the video and audio. Now, there is no reviews on Blu-ray.com for this film currently, which I feel like I would have liked one. I think the other two films have gotten reviews so far. But visually, because you do have two audio options. There is uh, DTS Master Audio 5.1 and uh, LPCM 2.0. I only listened to the 5.1. It sounded really good. It's got that classic... I watch a lot of anime, uh, a lot. I've watched a lot of anime in the past, and something like Your Name comes to mind, where it's like, you got a lot of realism with the sound effects, and that was very much, it. it's a summer feel, you know, it looks hot, it sounds hot, you got cicadas and everything. The sound design was nicely done. I didn't have any problems with the sound whatsoever. It was all pretty clear, mostly very focused at the front, but there was enough surround sound. It sounded pretty good for what it was. It's not the most extravagant soundtrack or audio track in the world, but it does have some nice tinges to it. So for the most part, it's pretty good. Again, I didn't listen to the 2.0, but I don't really know, given this is a 2005 movie, if it was designed originally with the 2.0 for like cinemas and then the 5.1 just for Blu-ray, I don't know what the specs details are with that kind of history, but I don't know if it was like remastered for 5.1 either. It could just be that they happened to render it in both and just stuck with it. Maybe it was just originally designed that way. Video-wise, it was really nice. It captures like the the warmth and color of the Japanese summer, which I think was a really good choice. Like the color grade and everything was really nice. 
There was no real issues, like no real noise issues or anything for the most part. For the most part, I will be particular because I think they filmed it with two different cameras for some scenes. Um, I note that particularly because there is a part, a really pivotal scene where a character gets knocked over and starts knocking over everyone else in a domino effect. And it's a slow motion sh scene. And there's a scene, it's like, it looks like an effects shot where a camera is flipping through the air and I think that they had to nail it with effects. And is like, an I the image that you're seeing, but it looks like the image that the camera is attached to kind of has like this kind of wall of lines attached to it. It's weird, it's, it's, it's hard to kind of explain, but visually, there is like a layer of line, so which is only in that one shot. That was the first time I realized there's something off about this shot. But that was like the only shot like that in the whole film. Like even rewatching it for the commentary, I noticed that part. Actually, not even for the commentary. When I watched the interview, they show scenes from the film, and you could see it there as well. So it's it's very clearly not just a oh, what's wrong with the Blu-ray? It seems to be something that was in the film transfer, which I think is a special effects thing. Secondarily, there is another effect shot that they have where they have this camera kind of creeping around the characters in a particular room. And there's a lot of kind of weird grain to it as well. Uh, some, some kind of lines along the side of the camera. I think it was the same kind of camera that they used. I don't really know. But that camera was used in some particular shots like that where it has this kind of texture to it where the rest of the image for the majority of the film doesn't so I think that they've used two different cameras for it or they've maybe like changed like the shutter speed or something they've changed something about the camera maybe the lens and it has caused this different visual effect which no one has noted <laughs> so I'm like okay that's that's perfectly fine like it gives a different feel to the scene which I think is the point but at the same time I could un like they're cutting also between a lot of the clear crystal clear perfect shots that they have for the majority of the film to these other shots because they're emphasizing like visually like the heat and how it's getting to the characters and the cicadas and the noise and all this kind of stuff so yeah I think it was just one of those technical things of maybe they didn't realize it until after the fact even though this might be a digitally made film I don't know because it looks like digital noise it's possible that it was filmed on film and has a digital They've used a digital camera for, the, for those particular parts and hence has this weird grain function, but it's 2005. I wouldn't be surprised if they were using digital cameras by this stage, but I'm not completely savvy in when people started using digital cameras to film because even something like David Lynch's Inland Empire, which is like 2006, is pretty early on in the, in the digital camera boom, so it's possible that they were like mixing between the cameras for this film. But either way, that's the only visual discrepancy I saw throughout the whole film, and it was mostly dedicated to that, like, ten-minute span of the movie. Well, not even... maybe five minutes when that visual effect shot happens, and then when that particular camera looks like it's been used, or that lens, or however it is. Even later on, when they do have the time travel effect shots, they look great. It's very Matrixy and like how they've got like st stop frames and everything going around the characters. I think that really works. It doesn't visually disrupt the film. Like it, it's not like the footage looks like shit or anything. So that doesn't cause any bad effects, which I'm down for. So and that was like also kind of like a different kind of camera that they use. So yeah, for the most part though, visually I'd probably give it like a four and a half out of five, maybe a four out of five. Um, if I was to give it a number, I don't really give numbers to things. <laughs> but yeah, visually and audio, it's a pretty good package. Uh, special features wise, the audio commentary for what I listened to was decent. It sounded alright. I didn't have any issues setting it up. Um, it automatically has English subtitles implemented. The film does automatically play in English subtitles. I went to the special features, like the extras uh, for setup, just in case but it automatically had that set up, you know, with the 5.1, with the audio uh, uh, for the English subtitles on, but you can choose the audio commentary either A, through the special features section or through the setup section for the audio, which I think is nice that you can do it for either or. Because usually those would be like reserved for the audio part of it, but because it's a special feature, 
you can go through the special features and hey, there's the whole entire film just with this whole entire commentary track attached to it. The interview though, which is pretty recent of an interview with the writer, wasn't too bad. Like it was nicely set up where instead of someone asking a question, you have the question up on the screen with the whole kind of color palette of this in a way, you know, got that kind of image. So, and it looked quite nice. You had the questions being asked about like the making of the film, what inspired the writer to make it. You know, did he have these kind of events happen to him? Not the time travel, but like hanging out with friends and joining clubs and stuff like that in university and high school. And what got him into writing, the whole drama thing. And um, as in like, he does theatre. So that's what got him into, because he was basically explained like his whole life in terms of that regard, like how like his dad was a, uh, into sports. He wanted his son to be in the sports, but his son didn't like sports that much. He ended up doing a lot of PC games and made PC games and then he joined um, his mates were like oh you gotta try out this club and well actually it was a screenwriting thing like a playwright and they you know his mates got him into it and then it got him into theatre and he joined his company and this film is mostly a play like it's basically a play that was adapted into a film because it was so popular as a play to the point that you know 20 years later it's still playing as a play and they're showing images of what the people are like at that and he's even showing telling you how like he's adapted parts from here and there and whatever so yeah it, it was interesting to get his opinion on like from like elements about time travel elements about um you know this kind of lifestyle uh, in terms of what's depicted in the film for youth culture why he thinks that the film still has an audience the cult audience and stuff like that so yeah, it, w it was good. And the, again, the comparisons between the play and the actual film. So I think if anything, it's only minimal in terms of special features, but an audio commentary of the director is definitely something that the film needs in terms of this release because there is no interview of the director. So I figure, yeah, the commentary is probably enough. I don't know if it's an exclusive to this release because I believe that there is a UK Blu-ray of the film that came out a year or so ago. So I can imagine that they probably did it for that release. Um, but for the most part, I think this stands up as a really good package. As an overall, I would definitely recommend this product. I'm yet to obviously check out the other two features from Chameleon Films. However, I will note that Blu-ray.com has already put up listing reviews for them, which is actually what reminded me of the fact that they had actually been released because I bought this as a three pack set for 95 Australian dollars. It shipped within like a few days, like I ordered on the Wednesday, it shipped on the Friday because public holiday on the on the Thursday, and it had arrived by the Monday. Uh, it was nicely boxed, all, all the packages were in shrink wrap, they were all bubble wrapped uh, and put in a box, and it was easy to track. So I knew when it had arrived, I was able to grab it from the door, easy peasy. So yeah, as a product, as a brand so far of Chameleon Films, you can follow them on Facebook. I don't know if they have a Twitter yet, um, but... Yeah, I'm interested to see what else they get to because I'm I, I like uh, the Asian market when it comes to films. There's a lot of random films from J uh, Japanese and Hong Kong cinema that I really really like, uh, and that some boutique labels have covered before. I still like that you know Eureka and Criterion have covered a lot of more specifically Japanese cinema, but there's the occasional Hong Kong film that they've dived into. It's mostly Jackie Chan. I know I love Jackie Chan as well. I've got a plenitude of his films. But I like stuff like this, like the kind of more wacky stuff. It's not too over the top, like it's still grounded enough, but they they play with the idea and I think that's nicely done. But yeah, for the most part, I think it's definitely a good film. I think it's a worthwhile product and uh, you go buy it. I don't fucking know. <laughs> sure, go check it out. I don't know, check out Chameleon Films. And um, yeah, that's, that's the whole video. Uh, I think it's a good package. I'm Again, I'm interested to check out the other two, mostly because these ones have a lot more to them in terms of special features. Exile in particular has, of course, you've got your uh, booklet, which actually has a few essays. Um, you've got two audio commentaries by Hong Kong cinema expert Frank Jen, uh, a video essay, an interview of the co-composer, and, of course, newly translated and improved optional English subtitles. And you've got, like at the making of a behind the scenes photo gallery two hong kong trailers a u.s trailer a video called exile dreams the cult career of josie ho i imagine she's an actress yeah she's one of the actors in the film so yeah they're not 
shy on putting in special features so and I like that about them like the fact that the blu-ray packaging is really nice the artwork's great reversible artwork the booklet the special it's just a fucking good package this is what I like to see in my blu-ray releases <laughs> I don't need sleeves I don't need steel books like this to me is the perfect package just that kind of a fucking you know artwork focused design I love these cases and I like the reversible artwork and the booklet. The booklet is limited edition, I will note, which is why I bought it as quickly as I could, and by as quickly as I could, I mean a month after it had come out. Almost a month. But, uh, yeah. Anyway, that's all for now. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Adios. Do I end with a time travel gag, or do I just leave?